Uh, is it Mueller? Or... Yeah, I'm recording. Oh, hey, I'm Mueller. Mueller. Are you Mueller? Are you also like letting people in the room? Yep, I will be in charge of that. Well, welcome everyone to Balkan Circle. This is the, our, our last session of this semester. We'll be back in January. Uh, my name is Mary Newberger. I'm a professor of history here at UT Austin, and I'm also the director of our Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, for those that uh, do not know me, my name is Kirill Avramov, and I'm the co-host of Balkan Circle. I'm an assistant professor of political science in the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies here at the University of Texas at Austin. And for our last session, uh, as we had back by popular demand, uh, one of uh, our previous guests, Yasmin Mujanovic, who is a political scientist and a policy specialist of Southeastern European and International Affairs, he has a PhD from York University in Toronto, and he has multiple affiliations uh, with think tanks and numerous uh, democracy and institutional and capacity building initiatives uh, related to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I am tempted to say that he is one of the uh, really uh, big specialists on regional politics. Uh, so his voice is always appreciated, heard, and his expertise is sought after. Currently, he is joining us from Southern California, where he told us that finally they got some rain. Uh, and uh, we're looking very much forward, Yasmin, to have you today uh, with us. Um, always thrilled, you know, when we will be talking about regional politics. Uh, so please welcome uh, as our final speaker for Balkan Cir uh, Circle Series Fall 2022. Well, Kirill, uh, Mary, thank you very, very much for having me. Uh, it's it's really a terrific honor to be here, and I'm also so grateful for, um, you know, for the fact that you have this platform. Um, you know, as as you know, in North America, although Eastern European studies has been expanding in recent years, although I have to say, unfortunately, I think largely for negative real world reasons, um, it is it is very important to have these spaces uh, within the US and North America more broadly, where we can talk about Southeastern Europe, and the Western Balkans, which obviously has its own particularities and histories. Um, and and obviously, I, I, I do feel very warmly towards uh, UT Austin, uh, given that this is my third time in, in, in various affiliations and capacities being here. So again, thank you very, very much. Um, you know, uh, I I want to kind of do, uh, I'm not going to say like a version of what I've said before, but I, I, I do think it's always important to lay the groundwork for, for conversations, um, especially given what we want to talk about today. And, and, and what I want to talk about today is this idea that I have, or not idea, I mean, I think it's a reflection of reality. And I'm hardly the only one that believes this. Um, that is namely that, you know, the contemporary Western Balkans have really come to the end of a particular historical phase in their in their modern history. And that is namely uh, the long period from 2003, essentially up until the, the near present, uh, which was characterized by the promise and belief that the region in its entirety would be incorporated into uh, the European Union specifically, as well as obviously NATO. So what we more broadly refer to as this notion of a kind of Euro-Atlantic project in the Western Balkans. Um, I think this project has ended. It has concluded. Now, I will say, you know, I'm somebody who's been arguing that it, that it had concluded already uh, uh, by the middle of the previous decade. So, you know, by about uh, 2014, 2015, I thought, you know, we were we were fundamentally at a, at a kind of political end. That was not a popular thesis at that time. Um, but I think, you know, four, five, six years after the fact, um, it is it is now an, an inescapable, not just conclusion, but again, obvious, obvious reality. And I mean, I think the most obvious way to um, to observe that is that notwithstanding the fact that, for instance, there is still some hope that, um, for instance, Bosnia-Herzegovina will be granted EU candidate status, possibly as early as this month, so before the end of the year, um, uh, you know, it, it is a it is a distinct possibility. Um, I don't think anyone, including folks in Brussels uh, or people in Sarajevo or any of the other relevant capitals, is under the belief that even if Bosnia is given candidacy status, that this will mean membership. Um, certainly not in the next 10 years, 
uh, probably not in the next 15 to 20 years, uh, you know, at that point, when we're talking 15, 20 years down the road in political terms, that's a non-event, right? Imagine, imagine a polit politician running on a platform that says, I'm going to improve your life in 17 years. That that's, that's a non-starter, right? And so this is the reality of, of where we're at in, um, in the Western Balkans. And I think, again, the most obvious way to observe um, the kind of the end of the existing Euro-Atlantic project has been, for instance, what uh, the government of France, in particular, the president of France has been, has been doing for the couple, last couple of months. This is this creation um, and his um, advocacy on behalf of uh, this project that he calls the European political community, um, which you know, is supposed to be, as as we've been able to gather or deduce to date, some kind of proverbial waiting room um, for not just EU membership, but possibly also EU candidacy, because presumably this community would also involve, well, again, countries like Bosnia, but also countries like Kosovo, uh, who do not have candidacy status. Kosovo has not been able to apply for candidacy status because it's unrecognized by five member states of the European Union. Uh, Kosovo still is the only country in Europe without visa liberalization. Um, you know, it, it, so it, it's supposed to be this kind of interregnum. Uh, but again, it's an interregnum where it's very much a question mark whether the final payoff will ever actually happen. And increasingly, it looks like it won't. Um, and at the same time, you know, the EPC, uh, in so much as we can abbreviate it, uh, doesn't really yet seem to have a lot of like actual policy documents associated with it. Like we, we all kind of talk about it like, oh, yes, France is championing the European political community. But what is it? Like what, what literally, what is it? What, what does it mean? What does it mean to be in the EPC? What does it mean not to be in the EPC? Um, and then... Uh, on, on the periphery of that, you have, you know, what up until recently we had referred to as this notion of the open Balkans. This was an effort largely spearheaded by the United States um, and also some local governments. It was it was essentially a kind of eco uh, economic social treaty uh, that was signed by the governments of Serbia, North Macedonia and um, uh, Albania, to which the other members of the WB6 were supposed to join but never did. And it was supposed to, again, facilitate, uh, you know, freedom of movement, freedom of goods, uh, cross recognition of educational degrees, et cetera, et cetera. There was a lot of pressure behind this for a little while. And then suddenly out of uh, the blue, kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious, uh, the long moribund Berlin process, which was yet another kind of association of local states, uh, uh, wakes up and actually, yes, there is going to be a, 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 a landmark agreement between all of the six states of the Western Balkans, uh, including freedom of movement, freedom of goods, freedom of capital, uh, cross-recognition of educational degrees, et cetera, et cetera. But it's going to happen in the, under the purview of the Berlin process rather than the Open Balkans, leaving the question, what happened to the Open Balkans? So I, I know I'm giving you a scattershot uh, uh, overview here, and that's intentional. Because what I'm trying to get you to understand is that we are dealing with a political and policy uh, uh, engine of chaos in the Western Balkans. Because fundamentally, what has happened in this region is exactly what I said at the beginning, that the, that the fundamental guiding political institutional framework for the region for the better part of the two decades the Euro-Atlantic project, getting these countries into the EU, getting these countries into NATO, that has ended. And it's now unclear what will replace it. And you have both European governments, you have the US, and you have even regional governments, uh, governments, pardon me, basically throwing darts at the wall and seeing what sticks. Now, this is not particularly inspirational. Right. For those of us who try to think in like long term systemic ways, this is not, you know, this is not accession, as it were, as we have come to know it. And certainly I think for, you know, quote unquote, ordinary citizens, uh, uh, folks in the region, um, I think it has also been an extremely disheartening turn of events. And I mean, obviously, the most the most disheartening episode in all of this was sort of the I think the the, the first moment in which. Uh, uh, the kind of the, the, the definitive end of the European enlargement project became evident. And that was shortly after the signing of the so-called PRESPA agreement between what is now North Macedonia and um, Greece. You know, after 
North Macedonia had changed its constitutional name to, to, to deal with this 27 year long dispute with Athens. Um, it, had, it had made major, major concessions, uh, political, constitutional, legal, et cetera. You know, the EU celebrates this landmark diplomatic accomplishment. The, the, the US does as well. You know, everyone, everyone is very, very happy. And okay, so, you know, the payoff is gonna be that North Macedonia is gonna get into NATO and they're gonna become a, at the very least, uh, uh, EU candidate state that is going to be able to actually begin negotiations, begin the formal process of uh, accession. And in fact, North Macedonia does become the 30th member of NATO. That That is a huge accomplishment, a very significant accomplishment. But the big prize, in a sense, for, for, for the, uh, you know, from the perspective of, I think, uh, uh, men and women and young people in, in North Macedonia who, who hope to gain access to the political and economic privileges afforded to them by being a negotiating candidate state of the European Union, um, that didn't happen. And it didn't happen because governments like France, uh, uh, Denmark, the Netherlands, also others, uh, basically at the last hour, when, when, the, when literally the decision was supposed to come down, said, no, we're not going to do this. First, they said, we're, gonna, we're not going to do it and we're going to delay it by a year. Then when the decision came up again, they said, actually, no, we're just not going to do it. And in fact, we're going to change the entirety of the accession process. And only after twice having delayed and, and sort of played around um, was was North Macedonia finally given uh, negotiating status. Now that was, to use a very technical political science term, ridiculous, right? <laughs> that was a ridiculous and 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 deeply, deeply, I think, humiliating moment for the leaders of North Macedonia, but I think also uh, the, the the citizens of North Macedonia. And subsequent to that, obviously, which is something that I know Kiru can can talk a lot more about, um, you know, we've had a, a kind of further, shall we say, backsliding in North Macedonia's status within the, the the architecture of the European Union, because now rather than Greece blocking North Macedonia's uh, movement forward, it is Sofia, right? Uh, again, rooted entirely in not, I think, we can't really say these are substantive political socioeconomic concerns, but rather these kind of identitarian, nationalist, sectarian concerns about, you know, who are the Macedonian people? What is the Macedonian language? What kind of claims about their history can they make, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this, all of this, I mean, if we just kind of use North Macedonia as a, as a kind of example, uh, uh, I, I think is indicative of a, of a much broader and fundamental breakdown. In, in the nature of the European enlargement project. And again, if you know, if if we had the time and we wanted to, we could talk about the situation in Kosovo, obviously the impasse, the continued impasse with Belgrade, um, the fact that, as I said earlier, you know, Kosovo remains uh, uh, technically without visa liberalization, although we are hopeful that actually there might be a finally a little bit of movement in the next few weeks. I was actually just talking to somebody in the European Parliament about this. They're they're cautiously optimistic that that you know finally we might get set, get somewhere with this. Um, you know, then we have the situation in Bosnia Herzegovina, obviously, which I've been writing extensively about, in particular over the last few months. Where you know, I'll just kind of flag it, and we can talk about it more in the Q and A mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a topic in its own right. That on October second, Bosnia had its ninth general election since uh, you know 1991, 1990, and um, on the day of the elections themselves, on October second, minutes after the polls had closed. The office of the high representative, the high representative himself, a former German parliamentarian by the name of Christian Schmidt, used his so-called bond powers, his executive fiat powers, to amend large segments of Bosnia-Herzegovina's election code in the federation entity and very significantly altered the government formation process in the entity and thereby de facto also in, um, in the country as a whole. So in other words, you have the top representative of the international community doing something, unilaterally changing election laws on election day itself, that, you know, had it been done by somebody like, let's say, Lukashenko, <laughs> I think the whole of the OSCE, the EU and NATO would have said this is, you know, this is despotic, this is authoritarian, da 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 but it's the OHR, so apparently it's fine. Very strange, very strange. So, okay, so so I've kind of painted this picture for you that 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 that, mm -hmm. that, that something really fundamental has has gone wrong. And so the question now is, well, what what comes next? And I think 
I've already alluded to the, you know, Macron's uh, uh, European political community. I think there's going to be continued efforts uh, on that front to, to make something of that. Uh, I am personally doubtful that, um, you know, very much will happen. Because mm -hmm. at, at least at this juncture, we don't even know what it is. So, you know, it, it doesn't seem like a finished pro pro product. Uh, and, and given the stakes here, given that this is supposed to be a kind of generational goal, objective, associational agreement, you need to come prepared. <laughs> you know, this is not one of those things where like, oh, I left my slides in the car. It's not going to work. Um, the other major kind of primarily European initiative that we've that we've heard about over the last year or two um, in various ways, and actually the, the open Balkan slash Berlin process thing is in some ways um, a reflection of this. This is what's sometimes referred to as the notion of a, uh, 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 a, a kind of mini Eurozone or a mini common market or a mini Schengen. Mm -hmm. Various kinds of terminologies have been used. That is the idea that actually what we want to do is we want to encourage uh, uh, economic and social integration among the countries of the Western Balkans, among themselves first and foremost, so that they can create a regional common market, and that regional common market can, in a sense, then in kind of one fell swoop, be integrated into the broader European common market. And the idea is that by doing this, you will then in a sense, kind of be able to work around some of these individual, shall we say, bilateral issues uh, or individual countries issues that, that that exist throughout the region. Again, I am suspicious that this will work, although there's been a lot more traction behind this idea. That has to be said. I mean, there's been some uh, fairly important legislation and, and agreements that have been signed. The reason why I'm skeptical is because as, as absurd as this might actually sound to some people, I think genuinely what people in the Western Balkans believed, excuse me, what, what people in the Western Balkans believed the European Union to be was fundamentally a union of values and principles. They understood it to be a mechanism for turning their countries into states like Germany or mm -hmm. Italy or Austria. They didn't actually have this kind of purely homo economicus uh, a, a conception of the EU, notwithstanding the fact that obviously emigration patterns from the region have been hugely influenced um, by, you know, comparatively poorer uh, economic prospects in the region than, than, you know, than, than in the EU. But actually, if you're talking to the most recent wave of, shall we say, migrants from the Western Balkans, these are people who are middle to upper class. These are people who have mm -hmm. done very, very well for themselves in the region, who yeah, have well, families with kids, exactly. And they're now moving to the EU. And when you talk to them about why they're doing this, they're not moving because they necessarily believe they're going to get a better job in Germany or Austria or Italy or wherever. In fact, many of them are quite cognizant of the fact that they will end up in worse economic straits. But what they do believe they will get access to is stability and security for their children that their children won't have to live in societies like Kosovo or Bosnia, where questions about ethnicity and sectarianism and, and blood counts and what's your last name um, are, are you know, the fundamental, fundamental political question of the day. Okay? And then finally, we get to the United States. And in many ways, you know, when the Biden uh, uh, team was elected, um, there was a lot of hope in the region, uh, in particular, I think, in places like Bosnia and Kosovo, because Joe Biden as a senator during the 1990s had really been um, a very, very outspoken advocate for greater and deeper American engagement. Um, in particular, on Bosnia, he was one of the so-called Bosnia hawks, um, along with um, you know folks like Joe Lieberman. Uh, mm -hmm. And others, uh, the 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 late Senator McCain and and and, and other folks. It was a, it was a bipartisan coalition of senators and and, and some representatives uh, like Frank Mikulski, uh, who were really really uh, you know 
urging and pushing and, and at loggerheads with the then Clinton administration, who they believed was not taking a strident and forceful enough um, position on the Bosnian war, and was also very, very critical of, of the prevailing sort of sentiment in Europe at the time, which was very, very hands-off, um, uh, in, in particular vis-a-vis -vis Bosnia. So, so in places like in Sarajevo and Pristina, when Biden was elected, you know, this was like, wow, you know, here's an American president who's finally going to get it you know, who understands our history, understands where we've been, and can really help these countries move forward. Um, maybe not on the EU ticket, but certainly on resolving some long-time bilateral issues, and then also, you know, NATO, and et cetera, et cetera. And it has to be said, um, it, it, it turns out that this was really a, a very significant miscalculation mm -hmm. um, by, by folks. Um, and, and I'll say this much, I mean, myself included, I, I really was in this camp um, where, uh, you know, I, I really thought that that um, President Biden was in some ways, you know, an old bulk in hand. I, 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 through my own work, had gotten a sense of some of the people who he still considered close uh, uh, confidants and, you know, Confident. people whose views he took stock of, not necessarily people who were formally part in, you know, part of the administration. Um, and, and I knew all of those people to be seasoned, experienced, knowledgeable experts on Southeastern Europe and Eastern Europe. And I thought, this is good. And it turns out that um, President Biden and Senator Biden are two very different people, right? And I don't want to go into sort of the complexities of American politics um, and why this might be, um, but I will say that what has happened in practice is that the U.S. in particular has pursued a uh, what I would characterize as a heavily bilateral and heavily transactional policy towards the Western Balkans. Uh, a, a policy that actually stands quite at odds with the president's uh, purported commitments to sort of the global struggle for democracy, which was sort of one of his landmark uh, campaign promises. And, you know, he had the major uh, summit for democracies, et cetera, et cetera. That has not been what we've seen in the Western Balkans. One interesting factoid here is that, for instance, when that summit for of democracies did happen at the behest of the White House, one of the only countries in the world that was not invited, along with countries like North Korea <laughs> and uh, Russia, as I recall, was Bosnia-Herzegovina. It was the only country in the region that did not have representatives at the summit. What's fascinating about that is that Bosnia-Herzegovina's constitution is literally written by Americans. It is the Dayton Peace Accords of Dayton, Ohio, all right? Middle America. <laughs> uh, that, I, that was extraordinary, right? And then what we've seen more than that is, you know, when we had, a, you know, my, I made allusion to this um, electoral amendments by the Office of the High Representative in Bosnia-Herzegovina on October 2nd, um, there was only two embassies that came out and forcefully supported what the High Representative had done, the United mm -hmm. States and the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom was widely understood to basically just be following the line of the U.S. And in Bosnia presently, what the high representative is doing is largely understood to be entirely at the urging of the U.S. The EU uh, embassy effectively in Sarajevo issued a statement that same day that was extremely terse, um, extremely cold, uh, referred to the decision as having been solely made by the high representative and his entirely. And rather than saying that they supported the decision, um, the EU office in Sarajevo said that they took note of it. This is not, you know, this is not transatlantic language, my friends. Um, and we also have important members of the European Parliament who have explicitly come out and said, you know, we think this is an assault and an attack on Bosnia's democracy. Uh, they've actually tried to bring Christian Schmidt to the European Parliament to testify, but he refuses to go or he keeps saying that he'll go and then at the last minute he'll come up with excuses. It's a pretty extraordinary scene. Then on the flip side, you have the, again, ongoing situation with Kosovo and Serbia. Um, and if you follow closely what um, both American and European diplomats have been saying about this dispute, um, both the US and the EU at this juncture are far more critical of the government of Kosovo than they are of the government of Serbia. Even though Serbia is widely recognized as being a kind of near authoritarian regime, deeply aligned with Russia, deeply aligned with China, Kosovo is a comparatively vibrant democracy, often referred to as the most pro-American or pro-Western country in the world. 
You had Josep Borrell, the EU foreign policy chief, give an extraordinary Paris conference a couple of days ago in which he by name, by name, uh, uh, specifically cited Kosovo and its leadership as supposedly having kind of led to the uh, 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 falling apart of the most recent round of negotiations with Serbia, something that had never happened before. Yesterday, then, Aleksandar Vucic, the president of Serbia, goes on this, I mean, astounding, and there's no other way to put it, but racist and chauvinistic tirade on national television, referring to the prime minister of Kosovo as, and I quote, terrorist scum. No statements from Josip Borrell saying, hey, this is inappropriate. No statements from the U.S. saying, wow, this is way out of line. In Montenegro, finally, and, and I'll kind of wrap this up here, um, in Montenegro, again, you had this protracted government formation, non-formation, government formed, government falling apart. Montenegro, depending on how you want to count, has gone through three or four governments in the last three years since a very, very contentious election in 2022. Um, and again, you have a situation where uh, the political West, in particular the US and the EU, seem to be largely in favor or cohabitating or somehow, you know, sympathetic to the political actors in Montenegro who are widely understood and known to be aligned not just with Serbia, but with Russia. And I hasten to add, this is literally officially the opinion of the United States government. Because a few months ago, the U.S. government, the Treasury and the State Department had issued a statement, issued documents that identified clearly specific actors in the Western Balkans who they claimed were directly on the payroll of the Russian Federation, including Milorad Dodik, the secessionist Serb leader in Bosnia, and the Democratic Front Party in Montenegro. The Democratic Front Party is one of the most important members of the coalition government in Montenegro, which the US and EU have been celebrating as reformers and anti-corruption activists and so on and so forth. So here's, here's the point that I'm trying to make about the US and, and I'll end on this. Um, the Europeans are trying to figure out um, some kind of you know, comprehensive structural solution for the region and they're failing because they're 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 not able to supplement or rather replace the kind of EU accession program which they don't want to go down because of all kinds of complex reasons within their own countries that we've discussed previously and I can discuss again in the Q&A. The US has taken a shall we say realpolitik transactional approach to the region. The logic of which is let's just sort out the major issues in each of these countries as quickly as possible and as sort of cleanly as possible. And then we can just somehow kind of shove them into the arms of the Europeans and we don't have to deal with it anymore. What that means in practice, however, is abandoning substantive commitments to the rule of law, substantive commitments to liberal democracy and human rights and individual rights, which are supposed to guide American policy. Because the quickest, easiest solutions are basically just to turn to the local elites, the corrupt criminal, ethno-nationalist elites and say, what do you guys want? In Bosnia, the Croat nationalist HDZ says, we want a sectarian election law. Boom, here you go. Milorad Dodik says, I want control over state properties. Boom, here you go, probably in the next few months. In Montenegro, uh, we just want a government that's going to get Milo Djukanovic out. Okay, here we go. Boom. In Kosovo, we want any kind of deal whatsoever. So if uh, it seems like that the Kosovars that are making problems quote unquote, by insisting on transparency, rule of law, uh, recognition of uh, uh, their culture, their sovereignty, their independence, their institutions, et cetera, et cetera. And Serbia is just saying, well, we're not going to do that, but here's a kind of bare minimum that we'll agree to. You take Serbia's side. And so this is essentially where we are in the region today. We have a United States that is pursuing a largely transactional foreign policy and a European Union that doesn't really have a vision for the, for the future. Um, obviously, there's a much more comprehensive and robust conversation to be had about what local governments themselves are doing in response to all of this. I haven't said very much about Russia or China, who are sort of on the horizon and other uh, outside actors, Hungary being one of the big ones. But I will stop here and we can go to the Q&A.
Thank you very much. I do appreciate Yasmin. Um, it's really, uh, from my perspective, it's really uh, reinvigorating, you know, to have a conversation with a broader overview of uh, for all of our audience about uh, the latest political de developments, uh, which unfortunately are not necessarily positive. Um, and I will start with a couple of remarks before asking Mary and then um, everyone else to participate, I hope in a lively Q&A because um, this is the fate of the region and very much uh, what you are observing and working on initiatives for Bosnia and Herzegovina actually do have much wider implications than people initially think or and willing to overlook. So hence my first question is, and I know as a political scientist, you would hate this, what I'll try to do. But as we are uh, at the end of this um, calendar year, I'll ask you uh, to tell us um, in your expectations for 2023, uh, what would be the major opportunities and the major crises that might you know, emerge on the horizon from regional perspective? This is one. Uh, number two uh, is to um, try one more time to explain why the lack of appetite for our audience uh, of the West to continue, discontinue sort of, in essence, the line of engagement and just rely, uh, you know, just go for local elites decisions, you know, which sometimes, you know, seem to be catastrophic uh, in essence, you know, from the viewpoint of integration. Uh, and um, I also um, am interested to hear um, a little bit about uh, one thing that, uh, you usually does not um, necessarily have time, you know, for ac in academic talks. What is, in your opinion, the most overlooked aspect of internal Bosnia uh, Bosnian politics that uh, analysts should um, should be cognizant of uh, when they're talking about those meta processes uh, at at um, structural levels such as EU so um, supranational projects? Right. Um... Yeah, so uh, there's a lot there. I'll, I'll I'll try to be sort of as efficient as I can to leave maximum space and room and time for others. So in terms of what I think the major crises on the horizons are, um, mm -hmm. this is not necessarily in sort of order of significance, um, but I think obviously the Serbia-Kosovo issue remains very charged. I know supposedly we had some kind of agreement a couple of days ago between, uh, yes. between Pristina and Belgrade over license plates. But again, this is sort of, damning in its faint praise that we're at the we're, we're 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 still in the position where we're you know disputes over license plate regimes are bringing us to the brink of actual violence i mean that, yes. that's how severe the situation has become and again some people uh, counter this and they say to me well you know this is a lot of posturing in particular by serbia and i agree there is a lot of posturing but you know, this is where my uh, uh, where my uh, PTSD addled refugee brain kicks in, which is mm -hmm. that violence creates its own logic, and yes. all that is required is for some young man in the wrong place at the wrong time who doesn't know how a Kalashnikov rifle actually works to pop off, kill someone inadvertently, or severely harm them, and off we go. That's all it yeah. takes. And, you know, the other line that you often get is both in Bosnia and, you know, Kosovo, Serbia and the region more broadly, it's like, well, there's no one left to fight wars. Yeah, here's the thing about that. All you need for wars and the scholars of violence in this room will know this uh, is a couple duffel bags of cash and maybe some drugs. Um, wars and violence are, are rarely, if ever, mass events. They are always events orchestrated by entrepreneurs who lead comparatively small segments of the populace into extremist ends. Right. Yes, yeah, so as you mentioned, you have a pre precipitant event could be a small exactly. Slice, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so this is the thing. I think Kosovo Serbia remains a major concern. Um, I think we're unfortunately going to keep seeing very significant, um, at least political tumult in Montenegro. Um, the thing that I'm worried about there is something that I previously talked about in, in previous years about North Macedonia, and I think now it's far more true of Montenegro, is that we're increasingly seeing a turn to the politics of the street. 
right? Mm -hmm. Parliamentary politics is breaking down and we are seeing political actors on, on, on both sides of this dispute, which now involves, you know, the churches and the question of identity and, and the relationship with Serbia and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it is increasingly becoming a street-based mobilization. You know, I will remind you a couple months ago when we had the so-called enthronement of the new uh, patriarch of the Serbian Orthodox Church in Montenegro, that process was so controversial and so contentious that you had barricades uh, being guarded with people who were armed and had Molotov cocktails leading into the old royal capital of Cetinje. Um, the city itself ended up having to be sort of basically occupied by riot police. There was tear gas wafting all throughout the city. The, the patriarch had to be literally flown in via helicopter and escorted by armed police officers and un, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, non-uniformed officers as well into the monastery. I mean, it was preposterous. And this is, again, the kind of stuff where I think this can very, very easily get out of hand. And then finally, of course, we have Bosnia-Herzegovina, which Whose, whose governance structure, I mean, for lack of a better term, is fundamentally broken um, and, and, and arguably has been made worse by the most recent interventions um, by the uh, 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 high representative. Just today, we were expecting a ruling from the Constitutional Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina about the high representative's interventions. And the court, in effect, did not rule because what it said was, we're going to delay the decision. They refused to uh, grant an um, immediate injunction, uh, mm -hmm. but they they said we will issue a final ruling in in we don't know when. The reason why this matters is that, and I and I will go on the record and say my expectation is that ultimately the constitutional court will strike down large segments of Schmidt's law. Mm -hmm. If it is an actual court, it only has to rule on precedent because. The Constitutional Court has previously struck down decisions by the high representative, and moreover, every single constitutional expert that I've spoken to that has actually examined the contents of the law says this is, this is preposterous. I'll give you one very short example of why it's preposterous. Schmidt's law uses two different metrics in different places for the so-called delegation of um, the delegates in the House of Peoples. In some places in his law, Schmidt uses the still only legally binding census in Bosnia-Herzegovina upon which ethnic seats are distributed, which is the census from 1991. In other places, however, he uses the census from 2013. Oh. Why? <laughs> right? This, this is completely incomprehensible. So, uh, but here's the, the reason why this matters is that we now have a situation where the constitutional court is refusing to rule or is delaying mm -hmm. a ruling, which means that governments will be formed on the basis of the current law but the expectation is that the constitutional court will then actually strike down the laws on which these governments were formed, which will then bring into question the legitimacy of the governments that were formed in the first place. So it's, it's I mean, it's a preposterous situation. Um, so, and, and, and this is, here I'll also kind of jump to your third question. You asked me what I sort of feel at this juncture is kind of the most underappreciated element in, in sort of Bosnia's domestic politics. Um, and I have to go on the record and, and, and say that at this juncture, I am more worried about Croatia and in particular the Croat nationalist establishment in Bosnia, the HTZ, than I am uh, concerned with Serbia or with Dodik. Because, and the reason for that is twofold. One, I think there's been more of a recognition within the international community that Dodik is an extremist and prepared to engage in violence. And so, my understanding and my sense has been that there is at least a kind of modicum of consensus about mm -hmm. what he can and can't do and what we collectively are prepared to do to stop him, which is good. I'm not thrilled about the continued refusal of many uh, Western governments to, to speak truthfully about what Serbia is doing in the region, not just in Bosnia. But nevertheless, um, that pales in comparison to, to what Croatia has been doing over, over the last two years in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The scale of Croatian government interference, meddling, and sabotage, for lack of a better term, in Bosnia-Herzegovina's domestic politics is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. I mean, it is. I have referred to it as essentially a kind of colonialist project towards Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, and, and it's creating such resentment and such anger in Bosnia that I think that is still not appreciated and being dismissed 
by many of my Western interlocutors that I'm, I'm genuinely, genuinely afraid. And I'm especially afraid because of two reasons. One, the very basically far-right president of Croatia, Zoran Milanovic, even though he was a former social democrat, um, he's now explicitly begun engaging in genocide now vis-a-vis -vis Bosnia. So he sounds more and more like somebody like Vucic or Dodik, and he's also very, very close to Dodik, it, it should be said, as well as the Russians. Um, he is whipping up anger and resentment. Every time he speaks, he says something inflammatory, people get angry, and then he shows up in Bosnia, and he goes to these, again, these kind of sectarian Croat nationalist events, and again, says more inflammatory stuff, and then he leaves. Simultaneously to that, the government of Croatia, both the prime minister and the president, have been pushing for Croatian troops to be deployed to Bosnia-Herzegovina as part of the U4 mission. This to me is fundamentally unacceptable, not just because Croatia is a signatory of the Dayton Peace Accords um, and, and, and therefore should not in any sense of the term be allowed to deploy armed forces to Bosnia-Herzegovina again, but also because we now know that the actual Croat nationalist establishment, the HDZ in Bosnia-Herzegovina in the lead up to this whole election reform thing had explicitly begun threatening violence. They used the phrase trouble in the South. If they did not get what they wanted vis-a-vis -vis the election law, uh, they would foment what they called trouble in the South. The fear is that essentially Croatia is positioning itself to do what once upon a time Syria had done in Lebanon. <laughs> this kind of essentially like a de facto occupation on behalf of very particular, exactly. <laughs> and, and the fact that this could run through official EU and potentially even NATO channels is, is deeply, deeply alarming to me. And I, and I hope there will be enough common sense to say to Zagreb, absolutely not. Like we've well, given you a wide leash. You've gone a long way down the road getting what you want, but this is, this is not going to happen. Yasmin, thank you very much for going on record for us. I think that the verdict is is quite um, you know, is in and it's yeah. quite visible. And uh, if I can summarize before I pass it to my colleague, uh, sure. I mean, basically what you are forewarning us is this return of identitarian politics, which is on a rise uh, in coupled with inability of certain countries in the region vis-a-vis, -vis, I'm looking at Bulgarian politics, you know, to foreign governments. Uh, and um, in essence, that means that political crises, you know, which have been unfortunately uh, hanging in the region do provide opportunities for populist and uh, specifically right-wing populist leaders to gain ground on, on many reasons. So thank you very much for, for this. Well, it's dark, but it's better face reality than, you know, hide our heads, you know, like the uh, policy of, of not recognizing what's going on in the Balkans. Thank you for that, Mary. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for this. It's so informative. And one of the things I want to ask you is what are your kind of, what are some of your sources of news on a daily basis so that various people coming to Balkan Circle can, can um, also be as informed as you are possibly um, that. But um, I also have a couple of questions. Like, this is really worrisome. I mean, I kind of knew some of this, but I now I'm even more alarmed having kind of heard all of this from you. <laughs> I mean, I guess the question is the idea of kind of an integrated Western Balkans seems really problematic and unrealistic, particularly because we have, you know, Serbs, Croats, Bosnian Muslims, and Kosovar Albanians all within that group. And so one wonders you know, one would hope that there could be an economic or political association, but maybe does it even make sense to push something like that, <laughs> given those kind of divisions within? Um, so there's that. And the other is with the EU. I think it's so funny. I've been for a long time. I, too, have been saying, first of all, the EU is a sinking ship. <laughs> you know, um, and so, and I don't know what you think about that, but, um, but second, if they integrate the Western Balkans, I think they'll sink even faster and harder, but I also don't think it's good for the countries of the Western Balkans. I mean, maybe that's not fair to them if they want to be in, you know, and they can be in, then that's fine, but there's also some really big costs um, for that. And one, I just remember meeting with um, some official from Croatia soon after they joined, and all she could say is, I wish we still had that hope of that joining was going to solve all our problems. <laughs> now we know it's not, 
Um, and maybe it creates new ones like brain drain and stuff like that. So um, is that even the answer? And why is it, I mean, if this project is over, which I agree it is, then why the farce of candidacy, you know, and, and even extending new kind of candidacy <laughs> status to people? I mean, it just, it just feels really, like you said, ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's what we might refer to as like, you know, Schrodinger's enlargement process. Nobody wants to admit that it's dead, but everyone knows that it's dead. But if you say it's dead, then you have to do something about it and you can't. So now we're just going to kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge the whole thing. I, I, I think, I think, and, you know, that sounds facetious, but I think that fundamentally is the answer. There is not the political will and the political courage to actually speak truthfully about what, you know, the state of European politics at this juncture is. I don't know whether I would go so far as to say that the EU as a whole is a shrinking, a sinking ship, but I do agree with you that, 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 that there has to be a very, very comprehensive um, reimagining of what the quote unquote European project is. Because putting aside the Western Balkans, what are we going to do with Hungary? What are we going to do with Viktor Orban? And what are we going to do with other governments in the EU who are tending in that direction? Uh, this is a major, major issue. And it's a major issue for NATO as well. I mean, we have seen what Orban has been doing vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Um, so this is, this is a very, very difficult position that the broader Euro-Atlantic community uh, finds itself in. And again, the solution fundamentally has to be political rather than technocratic. We need to confront the, the specter and the danger of kind of renewed nationalist authoritarianism rather than just sort of like rejiggering, you know, Article 2.478B. That's not, that's, you know, that's not what the hour calls for, as it were. Um, <clears throat> and also, you know, just uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, with 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 respect to my you know Ukrainian colleagues who who obviously are uh, doing something incredible and heroic at this juncture, I think what I have been trying and and here I have to kind of speak as a Bosnian and and you know somebody who had some some experiences with the Bosnian War and the broader dissolution of Yugoslavia, um, you know don't don't hold out hope that you will ever become EU members like that. Your struggle is the liberation of your country um, first and foremost. And, and, and ultimately, that may be the only thing that you get <laughs> out of this process, I think, unfortunately, um, because, you know, I, I was I was for giving Ukraine candidacy status. Um, but at the same time, I, for instance, found it preposterous that Moldova was given candidacy status. They had applied in March. Four months later, they're an EU candidate. Bosnia-Herzegovina, which had applied in 2016 and has had... Uh, you know, a large scale American and European presence for decades, while 18% of Moldovan territory is under de facto Russian occupation, suggesting that what Russia had done a better job of preparing Moldova for EU candidacy than the EU and the US had. I mean, it's it's ridiculous, right? And and again, God bless. I have I have no actual fundamental issue with giving Moldova candidacy status. Don't get me wrong, but 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 it invites comparison and the comparison then makes a farce of the entire thing um anyway so uh in terms of resources i mean look the stuff that's accessible in the english language is obviously things like you know balkan insight uh Pristina insight um just security for instance often tends to publish a lot of good stuff on the region uh foreign foreign policy that has in in recent um in recent years as well what i always say to people though is if you want to work on this region you do you need to learn the languages um so you know it you can't be an area expert and not speak the languages like i'm i'm sorry it, it's just not it's a non-starter and 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 i say that with respect to some colleagues who perhaps in previous generations were area experts and did not speak the languages. I, I find that extremely problematic. So you do need to access it because this fundamentally then allows you to access local media. Like people know me, I think primarily through Twitter. A lot of what I do is essentially translating and giving people some kind of access to local media and, mm -hmm. and local media debates, uh, which tend to be obviously more technical, more complex and more detailed than the stuff that you're going to read in Balkan Insight. And that's not at all a knock on the amazing work that they're doing. I had a long time column with them. They're doing fantastic work, um, but but it's still 
for a different kind of audience. All right. Um, so that's the thing. And, and I do have to say, um, you know, uh, notwithstanding some of the recent controversy about Twitter, uh, to my mind, actually, Twitter has become a really um, important medium for a lot of my own research and following about debates. You know, I, 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 we've now seen virtually everyone of, you know, sort of the works in policy politics, analysis, research, et cetera, et cetera, is, is really part of that sort of broader Balkans community on Twitter in particular. So, uh, you know, check it out, start following things like Balkan Insights, see who follows them, and you'll very quickly establish your own circles. Well, Yasmin, thank you for this. Uh, the one thing I just uh, interjected, because you're preaching to the choir, uh, Mary is a head of department, always been repeating about the languages, right? And uh, <laughs> as we are an area studies program, it's kind of a must. So thank you for just reminding our audience that we'll be watching later on uh, about the importance of, of uh, picking up the local language and working with original sources. Sorry, Mary. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's just one aspect to my question I wanted to reiterate because I know I had like kind of numerous questions embedded in. Um, one is like, and is entering the EU um, the answer? Like, has it, do you think, especially for those adjacent countries that have entered. I mean, is that something that um, actually is going to make a difference for these um, futures? Here's the thing. Uh, there's two ways to answer that. One is to say that um, when I'm thinking about countries like Bosnia, when I'm thinking about countries like Kosovo, uh, NATO membership is far more important for these countries than the EU. And the unfortunate reason for that is because what NATO provides them is the thing that the not just the EU, but I think the broader enlargement process has not actually dealt with. And that is the still very present threats to these countries' sovereignties, territorial integrity, and their overall security and stability, which comes primarily from neighboring states, Serbia in the case of Kosovo, Serbia and Croatia in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia in the case of Montenegro, which is why it's important that Montenegro is in NATO. <clears throat> um, so that's that's one thing. And, and, and the broader kind of um, upshot of that is that I think one of the things that has really fundamentally gone wrong um, beyond all of the other myriad problems with the enlargement project in the Western Balkans is that we collectively try to integrate these countries into a pan-national quasi-federal union before we had ensured that all of them individually were fully sovereign actors. Now, I know this makes me sound a little bit like a Eurosceptic and I'm really not, but I think this is to me, uh, uh, this is a matter of basic logic. You cannot take something that is fragmented internally and then like glue it to a bigger organism and be like, that's fine, don't touch it, just walk away. It's not gonna work. And this is why, to me, you know, when I when I talk about the, like the EU, like I'm for it. I believe in all of the values. I believe in all of the norms. I believe in every aspect of it in that sense. But it has to be premised on realizing actual political objectives. We have to have rational, democratic, representative, transparent and accountable governance in these countries first before we can have any kind of meaningful conversation about them joining the EU. I mean, we had, the United States has a has a so-called uh, regional envoy, a gentleman by the name of Gabriel Escobar presently. Um, and Mr. Escobar gave a talk a while back to some uh, Croatian media in which he said, vis-a-vis -vis Bosnia, he said, well, Bosnia uh, can become a so-called civic state, i.e. a kind of European style liberal democracy. It can do that, but it can only do that once it has joined the EU. And I thought, wow, this is actually fascinating because this is exactly the problem, because this is literally impossible. The whole process of EU accession is that countries become liberal democracies and then you join. What he's saying is, no, we're going to take this mind-bogglingly complex ethno-sectarian regime, which doesn't allow Roma and Jewish folks and folks from mixed marriages to stand for executive office and all other kinds of discriminatory provisions. Yeah, we're going to take that country, we're going to shove it into the EU, and then we're going to allow them to become a liberal democracy. What? You know, if you think Orban is bad, just wait until we have Dayton-Bosnia EU member state. <laughs> 
I mean, it's it's preposterous, right? So this is the thing. Um, you know, to, like I can't give you a simple answer. Is the EU, uh, uh, you know, is is the EU the answer? Yes and no. I mean, yes, if it if it, if it was all happening in the right way, but it's not. So therefore, it's not. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, it's it's uh, again, it's a it's a pretty frustrating um, sort of situation we're all collectively in. But I mean, with regards to Bosnia, I mean, is it? Is there at a point where we have to just admit that it's not going to work? I mean, that this kind of configuration of putting people together in a state that were, you know, committing genocide against each other and other war crimes, like not so long ago, um, that well, perhaps that's not going to work? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think, you know, with respect, I would, you know, it there was one genocide in Bosnia and it, and it came from one very particular political project. And I think the failure in Bosnia has not been the insistence on a single sovereign Bosnian state. It has been uh, the, the false belief, and I always compare it to this, that you could expect that a, a country would sort of have any kind of resemblance of rational governance while you have empowered and entrenched and ensconced and institutionalized the most malign anti-system actors possible. It's like if in 1945, we had said, we have liberated France, but actually we're gonna keep Vichy France. And let's see how France does after 1945. It's not gonna work, right? The, the, pro the problem in Bosnia is the way in which this purported solution was imposed, which is incidentally why I have been very outspoken about the fact, and I'm very worried about when people like Emmanuel Macron or even Joe Biden start talking about the Ukrainians need to start negotiating with the Russians, because I know what that means. What that means is that they want a Dayton style solution for Ukraine that's going to turn, you know, occupied Donetsk and occupied Crimea into entities or cantons where separatist authorities are going to remain in power. And 25 years down the road, people are going to be saying, well, why doesn't Ukraine work? Well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> right. So this is the thing. Um, you know, the problem is not uh, 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 Bosnia's existence or it's not even it's not even even the problem of multi-ethnicity or pluralism in Bosnia. The problem is that we have created a system that has perverse incentives, that incentivizes sectarianism and obstructionism and extremism and brinkmanship. And then we say, well, this doesn't seem like it's working. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, as somebody who's been saying it's not been working for most of my adult life, uh, you know, yeah, the, 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 the really the part that I can't get over is that, you know, I often have these conversations with Western officials where we'll go down the road and they're like, oh, yeah, this is terrible. This is dumb. This is horrendous. Da, 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 da. And then we get to the point and they're like, OK, well, maybe actually what we need is like still deeper ethnic division and sectarianism. And it's like, what? What, what convert? Who have I been talking to for the last 45 minutes? This is the thing, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's that's that that would be sort of the the the, the answer to that part. <laughs> um, Catalina, did you have your hand up with a question? Okay, go I'm ahead not, and ask. It. Yes, hi. It's nice to see <laughs> you. All. Um, it's not necessarily a question, but it is an observation. I could take everything that uh, Jasmine talked about and applied it to the Middle East or Central Asia and look at how the project of Afghanistan or the project of Iraq failed under <laughs> both European and uh, US um, um, you know, administration. Um, and I still, and I would like to also ask you, Jasmine, do you think, and I'm still thinking about this, do you think it's a problem of misunderstanding the peculiarities of these regions, their histories, the way they functioned, um, not in, in now contemporaneously, but in the past? Um, or is it just a problem of political expediency when you just don't want to do particular things because they're not at war currently? Uh, you don't have to take a, a, a quick decision about how to fix a, a, a conf conflict zone like they do 
now with Ukraine because there is a huge war going on there and they have not done that, um, mm. you know, with the Crimea, when Crimea yeah. was occupied. Yeah. So, so what's your take about that? Because you still failed Middle East, in my opinion, you still yeah. have parts of failed Central Asia and you have this failed um, Western Balkan project. Thank you. It's a, yeah, it's it's a very good question. And I mean, I think in some ways, obviously, the answer is both. But I but I want to give a more substantive answer. So I think you're right that, um, you know, there has been a tremendous amount of misunderstanding of particular histories. I mean, there's there's no about, doubt about that. Right. I think still to this day, the most widely read book about the Balkans is Robert Kaplan's Balkan Ghosts, which is like, you know, a horror show. Um and, you know, we know how influential that book was on on um, President Clinton. And, you know, I, it still often pops up, you know, people email me and they're like, well, I've been reading Robert Kaplan. And I'm like, please shoot me in the face. Um, you know, uh, so, yes, that that's an issue. Um, and, and, and what that also often results in is you get the most sort of banal interpretations of history in regions that we don't want to spend the time unpacking. You know, this is the ancient ethnic hatreds or when President Obama said about Syria, you know, these people have been at war for millennia. What? You know, who, first of all, who are these people uh, that you're talking about and who's been war for millennia? Um, but I think the answer is actually the latter part. Um, and, and, I, and, and I've come increasingly come to this view because I have spent time now working not just in policy communities, but like in political communities, among political decision makers. Um, the, the, the path of least resistance will win out 99% of the time. It, it's that simple. And there are very few governments in the world for whom foreign policy trumps domestic concerns. And you can see that vis-a-vis -vis France uh, and the sort of European enlargement project. French politicians are more concerned, people like Emmanuel Macron are more concerned about the fact that they have an ascendant far right in their country. They have to win elections against people like Marine Le Pen. And it's hard to win against Marine Le Pen and that kind of electorate if you are seen as advocating for the integration of Muslim majority states into the European Union. Let's be blunt. Uh, you have to say to your electorate, well, no, we are enforcing principles and norms and blah, blah, blah. Um, because you have to win election, you have to win re-election, and 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 on on down the road you go. And as you said about Crimea, you know, Ukraine hasn't been at war for eight months. Ukraine has been war at, for eight years, but we didn't want to talk about it. We use this 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 incredible, and I and I apologize for the term, but this stupid rhetoric about Russian-backed separatists. No, they're just Russians. They're just Russian occupation forces, and they've been in Donetsk and they've been in Crimea for eight years. Russia has been occupying uh, Ukraine for eight years, but very few Western governments wanted to deal with it. And so it was, you know, we condemned the annexation of Crimea, we condemned the occupation, but we didn't really do anything about it until, you know, now we have to do something about that. And that's, that's, you know, that's, that's fundamentally where we're at uh, with the Western Balkans. It's not on fire. It hasn't been technically on fire for a long time. So what are you going to do? And, and other things keep coming up. Iraq, the migrant crisis. I mean, to be honest with you, the Western Balkans got more attention in the context of the migrant crisis than they've gotten in the context of the Ukraine crisis. Because in the migrant crisis, these governments were propped up and used essentially as border guards by countries like Austria and Hungary, uh, uh, you know, rather than the present. So uh, I would say to your question, I think it's more the latter, though obviously both, both are a factor. Thank you. Um, Hannah has a question, or Hannah. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> oh, Hannah, thank you. Uh, hi, Esmin. Thank you for uh, doing this talk. I found it very informative. Um, I'm not a political scientist, but just, yeah, my background is Montenegrin Albanian. And being in that community, I've uh, felt like I've noticed an influence that you didn't mention. And I was wondering if it uh, is an influence that's rising or one to be uh, worried about, which is uh, that of Turkey, uh, predominantly, you know, Muslim influence as well. And so, yeah, just wondering if um, you've seen evidence of that rising mm -hmm. in the Western Balkans and if that's uh, another influence to be concerned about. 
I mean, it's certainly a, an influence to be concerned about in light of the fact that Turkey at this juncture can no longer be considered a democracy. And any kind of a liberal or authoritarian influence uh, in the region is something for me that's worrying. Um, the caveat uh, with uh, Turkey is that um, Turkey is a very significant economic footprint in the region. Interestingly, for instance, Serbia is the largest recipient of uh, Turkish investment monies rather than countries like Bosnia or Albania, which are Muslim majority and you would expect would be you know, the actual target, but it's actually Serbia. And this actually says something to us about the nature of Erdogan's thinking and foreign policy towards this region. Um, in my experience, Ankara's foreign policy towards the Western Balkans is first and foremost guided by supreme self-interest. The most active that Turkey has been in the region was in the wake of the coup attempt in Turkey, when uh, Turkish basically special forces went around places like Kosovo in the dead of night, abducting people that they claimed were Gulenists, um, or putting pressure on various regional governments to shut uh, uh, Gulenist schools and so on and so forth. But interestingly, when you look at, for instance, um, Turkey's actual political influence over domestic governance in these countries, it's quite minimal. Mm. This is not something Turkey is particularly interested in. It might become interested in it at some point, and that's something to be concerned about if it's still an authoritarian state. Um, but at this juncture, for instance, it, it, it is not a major factor. The most obvious place where it would uh, make sense would be, for instance, Bosnia, because of the close personal relationship that the party's leader, Bakir Izabegovic, has with Erdogan himself, and the two do have a close relationship. Um, but the SDA has not particularly benefited from any meaningful support from Turkey um, over, over the last few years. In fact, I can tell you privately, not privately, I mean, this is being recorded, <clears throat> but as I was told by somebody with firsthand knowledge a while back, and I can share this now because, you know, it's it's probably about a year or two old story. A while back, um, uh, uh, Erdogan had summoned the then presidency members of Bosnia Herzegovina to Ankara. Um, so it was Shefik Jafarovic, who was the Bosniak member, he's an SDA guy, uh, Dodik when he was still in the presidency, and Jirko um, Komšić. And, you know, they were going to talk about Bosnia and, and, and various other things of the region. And as the story goes, Erdogan basically turned to Jafarovic and Komšić and, and said to them, you know, explain to me why it is that we can't just kind of accept what Zagreb and Belgrade want. And Komšić and Jafarovic said, what do you mean? And he said, well, basically, like, why can't we just like split this thing ethnically? And Bosnia will remain one state, but we'll have three ethnic zones. And, you know, as I was told, Jafarovic and Komšić's response was basically that their eyeballs fell out of their faces because they couldn't believe that, you know, the, the one friend that Bosnia supposedly has, Turkey, so categorically misunderstood what the Bosnian, self-identifying Bosnian, but also Bosniak position was on the future of Bosnia Herzegovina. So this is the thing about Turkey. Am I worried about it? Yes. Um, but it's, it's in that sense also, I think, far less of an imminent threat to the region, certainly than Russia or China. And mm -hmm. probably at this point, you know, it's China, then Russia, um, and, and, you know, then Turkey. Got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up, but I have one last question. Who do you want to win the World Cup? This is the most important thing. Uh, Argentina, <laughs> because they're due. <laughs> that was great. You know, like, we were like, what? You know. So neither Croatia nor Serbia, you won't. <laughs> I mean, Croatia is excellent, but uh, they're not uh, they are not what they were a few years ago, unfortunately. I think they're past their prime, and I, I don't – this is not a knock on Serbia, but I just don't think they have a good squad. I mean, they have a good squad, but it's not good enough to go very far in the, in the tournament. Maybe. Viva Mexico. Yeah. Okay, Viva well, Mexico. There you go. There you go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, well, thank they have you a... so much for this conversation. It was very engaging and um, really enlightening. I think we all need to keep an eye on what's going on in – with the Western Balkans and the Balkans in general. And um, if you want to learn more, follow Yasmin on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Okay. Yasmin. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, again, we are looking forward. This is our last section. Uh, we're last session for uh, the season, but 
We invite you to come uh, at the next um, meetings we're gonna, we gonna have. We are having a fantastic lineup, very engaging. We're trying to cover as usual, as many topics as possible, ranging from history all the way to politics. So join us at Balkan Circle in January. Bye and have a good holiday season. <laughs>